Welcome to Know Alive. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. The series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by NOAA Science Camp and Washington Sea Grant, located here in Seattle, Washington. NOAA Science Camp is a hands-on summer science program that in other years is, is held in person at our NOAA Western Regional Center in Seattle, and it's designed to show you how NOAA science touches your everyday life and how NOAA offices work together to address environmental issues. Since this summer we're going online, we wanted to put together a series of webinars to give you a look at the kinds of science and opportunities that NOAA has to offer here in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. So this is the first seminar, seminar in a series of four that we designed to help you get to know NOAA. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and um, NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Jacqueline Lavender from NOAA's Olympic Coast Natural Marine Sanctuary, who's coming to us from Port Angeles, Washington, which is on the Olympic Peninsula. We'll also be assisted by her colleague, Nicole Harris, who is an education specialist at the sanctuary. While we'll, while we'll be talking about NOAA's role in ocean research and stewardship, we want to recognize also that we're all coming to you from um, we're all coming to, to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Jacqueline and Nicole's work in the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary is done in partnership with four coastal treaty tribes, the Macaw, the Quileute, the Ho, who have been stewards of their lands and waters for thousands of years. We would also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first peoples of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. And Jacqueline and Nicole are presenting from the traditional lands of the first people of Port Angeles, the Qualam people, past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions as well as answer the questions that Jacqueline will be asking you. It's usually along the right side of the screen, but may appear in a different location depending on what kind of device you're using. And many of you guys have been, um, have been writing into the question box already to tell, you, to tell us where you're from. Um, we encourage you to ask questions as we go and Nicole will keep, will, um, Nicole will keep track for Jacqueline. Make sure you look for the bingo card in the handout section. So there's a little section in that box that also says handouts, and there's a, a bingo card here that you can print out or you can look at on your computer screen, and you can keep checking to see if you get the bingo. Um, we may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. And also, if you find that you are having audio issues where you can't hear, try logging out and logging back in. That often solves the problem. Okay, enough of my talking. I'll hand it over to Jacqueline and Nicole to introduce themselves. And so, Jacqueline, if you can come on, that would be great. There you go. Okay, I'm going to turn off now. Hey, Jacqueline, you're muted. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks, Nicole, for letting me know about that. Um, my name is Jacqueline Lavender, and Nicole, do you want to say hi? Hi guys, I'm Nicole from Olympic Coast. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And for today's presentation, I am super excited to tell you about America's Ocean and Great Lake Treasures, our National Marine Sanctuary. And then we're gonna take a closer look at the amazing place that I work to protect, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. But before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I was born in Connecticut on the East Coast of the United States, and my parents took me on many land-based adventures that often took me on detours to explore ocean beaches. As I grew older, I had a huge fascination for the sea. What was it like in the middle of the ocean, beyond the land? And what lived in the, in the ocean surface? So I was driven to learn more about the ocean. So as soon as I graduated from the University of Connecticut with a degree in communications and marketing, I headed out to sea for my own adventure. Um, I ended up in Key West, Florida, where I worked on boats, bringing visitors, where I could, um, where we could explore the ocean environment through snorkeling and wildlife viewing. 
And then after many years, I earned a 100 ton United States Coast Guard captain's license all while traveling throughout the Caribbean, along the Eastern seaboard, and even taking a journey across the Atlantic Ocean. And as I traveled from one area to the next and then often back again, I noticed that the ocean was changing. There was more trash, there were more damaged corals, and there were changes that were caused by humans that were not good. And I wanted to be part of the change for the good. So that's when I started to get into education and outreach and working with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuaries. And then several years later, my fascination for the unknown pushed me to explore new areas. So I applied for work with Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary where they, with their education and outreach team. And lo and behold, um, I got the job and here I am well over a decade. So I also want to tell you about an exciting and fun opportunity for you. It's the annual Get Into Your Sanctuary Photo Contest. Um, this is an annual event that we accept applications through Labor Day, which is September 7th this year. And we'll be looking for photos or artwork in the following categories in sanctuary views, sanctuary life, sanctuary recreation. And that sanctuary at home is our newest category. This is all about you showing us how you're connecting to your National Marine Sanctuary from home. So this could be photos of stewardship activities. It could be um, from your home or your neighborhood, or it could be, like I said before, sanctuary related artwork with paintings or drawings. So if you're thinking about participating, just go to our website at sanctuaries.noaa.gov and navigate to the photo contest and go ahead and send in your um, submissions. So for those of you who want to play along, there is a trivia bingo card available. Uh, we emailed it earlier today, but in case you missed it, you can download it from the handout section. Um, that should be on your toolbox there. Um, each box has a question or a clue that I'm gonna go over today during the presentation. So be sure you pay very close attention. Um, to get bingo, you can answer five questions in a row correctly. And this could be, um, Cross, it could be um, up and down or diagonally. Um, and then um, you can let us know you got bingo by writing bingo, B-I-N-G-O, into the question box when you get it. Okay, so now let's get started. Take a look at our planet from outer space. It's easy to see that the Earth is blue. The planet is covered by this one massive ocean. In fact, more than 70% of the planet is covered by the ocean. And the ocean affects every human life, whether you live close to it or not. Did you know that most of the oxygen in the atmosphere originally came from the activities of photosynthetic organisms in the ocean? So the ocean actually provides us with the air we breathe. And the ocean also supplies with most of the fresh water. The most rain that falls on land originally evaporated from the tropical ocean. And the ocean uh, uh, moderates our Earth's climate and influences our weather. It affects human health. And from the ocean, we get food, we get medicine, we get mineral and energy resources. It provides us with jobs and serves as a highway of transportation for goods and people. The ocean is also a source of recreation and inspiration. So whether you visit its shores to, or go surfing or dive in or head out to go fishing for the catch of the day, it's there to enjoy. And the ocean is also central to many cultures. So now that you've learned all of these ways that the ocean affects human life, be sure to check out your bingo card. All right, now let's think about life in the ocean. The ocean is three-dimensional. It provides living space from the deep sea all the way up to the surface. So therefore, most of the living space on planet is in the ocean. And the diversity of organisms is much greater in the ocean than on land. And ocean life ranges inside from the smallest organism to the largest animal that has ever lived on Earth. Does anyone know what the largest animal that has ever lived on Earth is? We're gonna ask Nicole to go ahead and launch our first poll. This is a way for you to be able to tell us what you know and what you think. All right, guys, here comes the first poll. So what is the largest animal that has ever lived on Earth? Is it a megalodon shark? 
Is it a blue whale? Is it a whale shark? Or is it an Argentinosaurus, large dinosaur? If you can, go ahead and um, click your answer right in the poll. And we'll be able to count that. Looks like we definitely have some answers coming in. I'm going to give you guys about five more seconds to get your answers into the poll. And then I'm going to close it. And the poll is closing. And great, we had some great answers. And Jacqueline, it looks like 65% think that the blue whale is the largest animal that has ever lived on Earth. Excellent. Well, if you did say blue whale, then you would be correct. The blue whale reaches a length of 34 meters. That's 110 feet long and weighs up to 165 tons. That's 330,000 pounds. And here's some more fun facts that I find very interesting. A blue whale's heart is the size of a small car. And its aorta, which is the main blood vessel, is large enough for a human to crawl through. So with this understanding that the ocean is so important to life on the planet, it's up to us to protect it. So marine protected areas are designated throughout the entire world to conserve special ocean and coastal places. In the United States, we have a system of national marine sanctuaries designated to protect more than 600,000 square miles of marine and coastal waters from Washington State to Florida Keys and from offshore Massachusetts all the way to American Samoa. And the network includes a system of 14 national marine sanctuaries and the Papahana Makuakea and the Rose Atoll Marine National Monument. Here you can see on the map the blue dots. Each one represents a national marine sanctuary and the blue triangles represents our national marine monuments, excuse me, our marine national monuments. And the yellow boxes represents newly proposed areas that could one day be a national marine sanctuary. And there are few places on the planet that compete with these, the diversity of national marine sanctuary system, which protects America's most iconic natural and cultural marine resources. Each of these sanctuaries is unique and offering an ocean of diversity. So join me as we dive into national marine sanctuaries and explore. So national marine sanctuaries are places where whales breed and bear their young. Like these humpback whales pictured here, which migrate to Hawaiian Island humpback whale national marine sanctuary each year in the winter to mate, calf, and nurse their young in the warm, shallow waters. And sanctuaries are places where corals flourish. Would you believe that these corals and sponges occur more than 100 feet deep below the ocean surface in Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of California? And sanctuary habitats include coral reefs like the one in the Florida Keys, the third largest barrier reef in the world. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary also supports extensive seagrass beds, mangrove fringe islands, and more than 6,000 species of marine life. And the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa has one of the largest corals in the world. They call it Big Mama. <laughs> this giant coral has a circumference of 134 feet, and it stands 21 feet tall and is more than 500 years old. Unbelievable, right? <laughs> it makes this diver looks like a shrimp here next to Big Mama. <laughs> and in sanctuaries, we have shipwrecks that tell a story of our maritime history. The very first National Marine Sanctuary, the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, is dedicated to the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck that lies 230 feet below the surface in the Atlantic Ocean off of North Carolina's Outer Banks. Nearby in Maryland, Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary, which was the most recently designated National Marine Sanctuary, is known as the Ghost Fleet. That includes the partially submerged remains of more than 100 wooden steamships that were built in response to threats from World War I era German U-boats 
that were sinking in ships in the Atlantic. And then in the, in the, um, the uh, Great Lakes, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, located in Lake Huron, has over 200 vessels in and around its protected area. So as we go along, take a moment and check your bingo cards. Sanctuaries also support lush kelp forests and deep sea canyons like those found in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This treasured area protects the nation's largest kelp forest and one of the North America's largest underwater canyons that has supports an astounding amount of marine life. A National Marine Sanctuary includes routes for migration with one of the longest annual migrations of any mammal, roughly 10,000 miles per year. Gray whales are found throughout the West Coast National Marine Sanctuaries, from Channel Islands in the south, all the way to, north, to Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary in the north and well beyond. And sanctuaries provide habitats for some of the ocean's greatest predators, sharks. The live bottom reef of Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary off of Georgia provides important habitat for hundreds of fish species, including scallop hammerhead, seen at the top photo, while the nutrient-rich waters of Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary off of California's coast provide critical food for migrating white sharks in the bottom photo. And with all these ama amazing Creatures, wait a minute, what is this? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's a manta ray. <laughs> and it's in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Texas. In fact, research confirms that Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary is part of a manta ray nursery area. They can grow to be enormous with some reaching 22 feet from fin tip to fin tip. That's huge. And the sanctuary system includes one of the largest conservation areas in the world, Hapahana Makuakea Marine National Monument, located in northwestern Hawaiian Islands. This adorable little fluke is a white tern chick, also known as a fairy tern or manu oku in Hawaiian. These small birds breed throughout Papahana Makuakea Marine National Monument, and they're one of the 22 species of seabirds that breed and nest at the monument. And sanctuaries inspire people, <laughs> maybe inspiring you today. So students who participate in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary Art Contest in partnership with Mass Massachusetts Marine Educators turn marine education into creative works of art. Here, a student illustrated a comb jelly found in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. You may know the sanctuary better as a premier whale watching destination. Now remember, if you are inspired to create art about a National Marine Sanctuary, you can enter into the Get Into Your Sanctuary photo contest. So these special places, they exist off of our nation's coast. They're full of wonder um, and full of life. And this is where I work, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Washington State. Now I don't get to go here every day, but this is the place that I work to protect. And this photo was taken from Cape Flattery which is the northwesternmost point of the lower 48 states. And it's located on the Macaw Tribal Reservation and overlooking Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. Now our mission is to protect the Olympic Coast natural and cultural resources through responsible stewardship to conduct and apply research that preserves the area's ecological integrity and maritime heritage and to promote understanding through public outreach and education. And here you can see um, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary protects the area outlined in red. This is a large area that covers nearly 3,200 square miles and extends up to 40 miles offshore in the northern area. And then you can see how it follows the continental shelf to the southern region, reaching approximately 25 miles offshore. It includes three major submarine canyons and places of reaching a maximum depth of over 1,400 meters. That's 4,500 feet. 
it's really pretty deep. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up a video. You go ahead and check out your bingo card in case there's something we went over. And this video is gonna give you a better idea of what it's like in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. The Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary borders the protected areas of Olympic National Park, Washington Maritime National Wildlife Refuge Complex, Washington State Parks, as well as the native lands of the Macaw, the Quileute, and Ho tribes, and the Quinault Indian Nation. The sanctuary itself lies within the usual and accustomed fishing and hunting areas of these coastal treaty tribes and has supported humans for thousands of years. The Olympic Coast has many different habitats, from sandy beaches to rocky intertidal zones, kelp forests, and deep sea canyons. This makes it the perfect place for a wide variety of marine life to coexist. It actually happens to be one of the most diverse and productive marine ecosystems in the entire world, with 29 different species of marine mammals, 128 species of seabirds, and beneath the surface, teeming with numerous fish and invertebrate species. Let's take a dive with this harbor seal. What are some of your favorite marine animals? Go ahead and enter some of the names of your favorite marine animals into the question box. All right, great. So if you guys want to go ahead and put some of your favorite marine animals into the question box, and maybe Nicole, you can read aloud what folks are saying. I can. They're coming in, Jacqueline. We've got orcas, once said narwhals, those are awesome. Dolphins, sea otters, puffer fish, sharks, a dwarf lantern chef, uh, fish, sea turtles, angler sharks a barrel eye fish, blue whale, octopus, killer whales, dolphins, blobfish. We have a lot of answers coming in. These, these folks love the ocean. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, everybody. Um, well, I think I have a lot of the same uh, favorite animals as you guys do too. So I'm going to take you on a journey from the shores of Olympic Coast to the deep sea and where we learn about some of the favorite animals that travel and live in Olympic Coast. So we need to begin our journey with the intertidal zone. This is the area at the water's edge where the ocean meets the shore. This habitat alternates between the changing tides between dry and wet worlds. At the sandy beaches, you have to take a closer look since most of the organisms that live here they burrow themselves below the sand, filtering meals from organic material that wash over them. And at rocky intertidal areas, like you see here on the right, organisms that live here, they have to battle the elements daily. As the tides come in or recede, crashing waves threaten to rip these organisms from their home and cast them out to sea. So organisms that don't get pulled off and out to sea must survive huge temperature changes. So from the cold sea of the Olympic coast to the blazing heat of the summer midday sun. And then they risk drying out. It could be hours that they're exposed. And even those, those organisms that seek refuge in tide pools, they have to deal with fluctuating environments. So to survive these conditions, animals have to be extremely adaptive. So here is an example of our rocky intertidal area. There it is. We're gonna take a little bit more of a closer look. So here we have a closer look of many colorful sea ochre sea stars, giant green anemones. Those giant green anemones, you could see that they're closed up in order to hold in the water. And if you take a closer look, what else do you see? I see a chitin. Those are those oval shaped animals that look like fossils, at least to me they do. 
There's some on the bottom left and maybe up and toward the, the top middle, um, towards the left. And then there's tube worms. Those look like straws. You can see those off to the right and down on the bottom. And then there's whelks and other sea snails. Can you see all of those? And then when we take an even closer look at ochre sea stars, these colorful sea stars are predators in the inner tidal zone, feeding on mussels and other mollusks. And when they're eating, they actually push their body out of their stomach. I'm sorry, they actually push their stomach out of their body and into the shells of its prey. Now that's a pretty funny way of going out to eat. <laughs> And as we get ready to move through the inner tidal zone and to the different ocean habitats, it's good to point out that there are some animals who are seen in many areas from the inner tidal area all the way to the deep sea. Um, and like these Pacific, giant Pacific octopus, these are the largest octopus in the world. Um, and they have a stretched arm span of about 10 to 15 feet. And octopuses are boneless creatures, so they are invertebrates with extremely flexible bodies that can squeeze through even the most incredibly small spaces. A fun fact that I like about octopuses is that they have three hearts, nine brains, and blue blood. Pretty cool. So as we move offshore, there are these incredible offshore islands that offer refuge to seabirds and marine mammals. And we have sanctuary regulations that protect the animals from low flying aircraft below 2000 feet within one nautical mile of the coast and offshore rocks and islands so that the animals can rest and nest on these areas without disturbance, including common MERS. These seabirds breed in the sanctuary in dense colonies um, on sea stacks and on the flat topped islands. So these birds, they mate for life and they only have one chick per year. Per year. And their egg is laid on bare rock in a pear shaped, often on the ledge. So their eggs are pear shaped, like seen here. So this is an adaptation so that it will spin in a circle rather than rolling off the cliff if, there's, if it's been disrupted. And then here are some tufted puffins. Tufted puffins, they actually fly underwater. Now, what I mean by that is when they are feeding, they dive in the water, and then they fly with their wings. And then when they catch fish, they can hold up to a dozen fish carefully arranged head to tail in their bills until they return to their nest to feed their chicks. Now for an animal with no hands, that's pretty handy. We also have seals and sea lions. I often get asked, how do you tell the difference between seals and sea lions? Well, one way is that sea lions have external air flaps. So can you see the air flaps on the sea lions? Next, we're gonna visit the kelp forests and rocky reefs. These areas provide food and shelter for a variety of creatures, including many species of fish, marine invertebrates, seals, and sea lions. And sea otters, like pictured here, are often seen rafting and resting in and near the kelp forest. In fact, sometimes they'll actually tie their babies up in the kelp forest so that they can go down and dive. Now, sea otters are furry mammals that don't have blubber. So they're mammals without blubber, but they have adapted to life almost entirely in the water. They can do this because of that amazingly thick fur. In fact, sea otter fur is the densest of all mammals with more than a million fibers per square inch. Humans only have about 2,000 pairs per square inch. So that's a big difference, a million to our couple thousand. So this incredibly dense fur helps insulate it in our cold waters and keep it warm. But it also put the sea otter in high demand. In the 18th and 19th centuries, they were once hunted by fur traders to local extinction. In more recent decades, they were reestablished and are now making a big comeback. So sea otters are considered important keystone species to help kelp forests and uh, to help control the population of sea urchins who eat the kelp. 
So I'm going to take a moment and show you about some research um, that NOAA Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary does in partnership with NOAA Fisheries. So while I go ahead and switch over to the video, go ahead and check your bingo card. Sea otters are a keystone species or keystone predator that pretty well documented how their foraging, their feeding behaviors changes the community structure of the invertebrates that they're eating. In the outer coast of Washington, the sea otter populations were hunted to extinction or local extirpation, they call it. Around 1970, a few dozen animals were reintroduced from Alaska here on the outer coast. That population has grown in the last 45 years from a few dozen to somewhere upwards above 1,200 individuals now. We're out here with the National Marine Fishery Service. We've got two dive teams in the water here, and they are off doing surveys of the macro invertebrates, macro algae, to monitor survey transects that were last visited in 1999. One of the goals of the research program really is to just monitor the long-term health of the ocean here. We'd consider the sea otters to be both a charismatic species, but also an indicator species of ecosystem health. These are transects that were first established when the, the sea otter population was fairly small on the outer coast. Now the population has about tripled in size since the last surveys were conducted, so we're really interested in seeing what changes in the community have developed from that. Okay. That was great. Since then, sea otter populations have grown to over 2,000, so they're still continuing to grow. So let's continue on our journey. Here is a gorgeous China rockfish. Other rockfish, like the yellow eye, show you right here. These can live for a very, very long time. So I'm gonna have Nicole ask you a poll. How long do you think yellow eye rockfish can live? All right, guys, here comes our second poll. So how long do you think these yellow eye rockfish can live? You can choose 75 years, 100 years, or 150 years. And I can see you guys getting your answers in. That's awesome. While we're waiting for people to um, put their answers in, Jacqueline, I should let you know, we've already had some bingos today. We have some really smart um, ocean folks on, on our um, presentation today. And so we had, I'll just call out, Kiefer was our very first bingo. Um, Congratulations, and, Kiefer. Yeah, he did great. And then Karst and Oliver also were right behind Kiefer. And those were our top three. And now we've got about 10 people that already have bingo. That's fantastic. Well, you, you can go the whole way and get them all the answers. So we'll ask about that at the end. So if you end up getting that, you can put all into the question box. So how about this question here, Nicole? All right, you guys, I'm going to close the poll and it looks like 52% think 100 years, about 22% say 150, and another 25% say 75 years. Well, that's great. And there are great answers, but 150 is the correct answer. Can you believe it? Yellow eye rockfish can live to be up to 150 years old. Very long living. So let's move on out to the open ocean. Open ocean attracts many different animal species from the smallest to the largest. And I'm gonna start out with what's probably the most important animal in the entire ocean, plankton. Plankton are incredibly abundant off the Olympic coast during the spring and summer months. Plankton attracts and feeds many species of marine wildlife, including forage fish and invertebrates. And these in turn feed predators, including salmon and seabirds and many marine mammals. So they are definitely one of my favorites. 
And then we go continue in the open ocean, we see animals who migrate great distances to feed in our abundant waters, including humpback whales. These amazing animals are about the size of a school bus. And they are known for their acrobatics in the water and their incredibly long um, pectoral fins. They have the longest appendage of any animal in the animal kingdom at approximately 15 feet in length. And humpback whales, they live throughout the world's major oceans. They travel great distances during the seasonal migration with some animals migrating 5,000 miles each way between the high latitude um, summer feeding grounds like Olympic coast and the winter mating and calving areas of the tropical waters like Hawaii and Mexico. And then there are seabirds like the black-footed albatross who nest in areas like the Hawaiian islands, but then they wander or they soar widely across the Pacific for most of the year and are regularly seen off the west coast of North America, including Olympic coast. And these magnificent birds have a six to seven foot wingspan which are pretty good social, uh, gu good guidelines for social distancing right now. So be an albatross. And then we have an incredible fish like this mola mola or ocean sunfish. It can grow to be more than a ton or 2000 pounds. And it gets its name ocean sunfish because it's been observed lying flat on the ocean surface of the ocean in order to be worn by the sun. I like to say the mola mola though. Can you guys say that? Mola mola. <laughs> mola mola in Latin means millstone. And it was given this name due to the creature's gray color, its round body and that rough uh, texture, which is very similar to an old fashioned millstone. And then here is a leatherback sea turtle. These turtles are the largest turtles in the world. In fact, again, they can get up to be six to or seven feet long. And the leatherback um, is the only turtle that does not have a hard bony shell. A leatherback's top shell or carapace consists of a leathery oil saturated tissue. And it's a very unusual animal in that it can, can create some of its own metabolic heat. And then it exists in the cold water that is several degrees colder than its body temperature. So it can visit the cooler waters of Olympic coast and then also migrate great distances to nest in the warmer waters and islands. So leatherbacks feed on a diet of soft bodied ocean prey, such as jellyfish and saps. And then here is one of my favorite jellyfish. This is called a fried egg jellyfish. It looks a lot like a cracked egg floating in the water, but likely doesn't taste like one. Although it's not yummy to us, as I mentioned before, jellyfish are tasty treats for turtles, just like that leatherback turtle that we just saw. And another fun tidbit of information, um, a group of jellyfish is called a smack of jellyfish. <laughs> so here's a video I wanna show you of a diver who encounters a smack of jellies. Be sure to look at, at your bingo card as I pull up the next video. And you might also want to yell out smack when you see the smack of jellyfish, the group of jellies. Hopefully you saw that smack of jellies. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? So
So we also have some man-made visitors in the sanctuary. Noah uses gliders, like this one pictured here. These wave gliders are wave-propelled, solar-powered, autonomous surfboards that are tethered to an underwater glider with instruments that control speed and direction along a programmed or remotely piloted path. So these wave gliders, they can measure wave properties, currents, ocean temperature and salinity, exchanges between the air and water, as well as surface weather. And NOAA also uses sail drones. Sail drones can do adaptive sampling like research ships, but at a fraction of the price. Along the West Coast, you might see these sail drones. And these are used, um, these use solar powered instruments to collect and send acoustic data about Pacific hake and other fish species. So this autonomous vehicle helps us better understand fish populations, which are then used by um, management councils in order to set fishing quotas. And then also in the open motion, you'll see sperm whales that can be seen from the surface, but they also spend the majority of their time in the deep waters. They routinely make dives up 2,000 feet that can last up to 45 minutes, but they are also capable of diving to depths of over 10,000 feet for over 60 minutes. Their diet consists of many larger species like squid and shark and skates and fish that also occupy these deep waters. So I know we can't hold our breath as long as sperm whales. Um, at least I can't, and I don't recommend anyone trying. But in order in, for us to explore the deep, we rely on technology. So there's specialized te technologies like this remotely operated vehicle in the bottom left that allow us to better understand the diversity of deep sea habitats and the life it supports. So the sanctuary has these three major submarine canyons and places reaching depths of over 1,400 meters or 4,500 feet. This September. Follow us on nautiluslive.org. You can see the website up there above the ROV. As we explore deep sea areas along the West Coast, this is an opportunity for you to watch with scientists at the exact same time as scientists as we explore new areas. So you can check that out. Um, we'll have more information on our website and on our Facebook page. But here are some images that were captured during previous research expeditions. So these are some deep sea corals. Um, this one is a Paragorgia arborea pacifica, commonly known as bubblegum coral. This, like other corals, are comprised of hundreds to thousands of individual animals called polyps. And you can get a close-up picture of those polyps here. And then there are sponges like this beauty. Wow. I mean, this chalice sponge is very large and, like most sponges, um, very slow growing. So it's likely that it's also very, very old. You can um, see just a few examples of the life it attracts around and within its pores. And honestly, if we got really close, you'd probably see thousands of different animals. And then here is one of my favorite deep sea organisms, a cockatoo spid. It, it's a cockatoo squid. Its transparent body makes it easier for it to blend in with its surroundings. Um, and then you can also get a closer look at that cigar-shaped digestive gland. Can you see that there? All right, I'm going to take a moment to show you one more video. And then this one here is of the deep sea. Go ahead and check your bingo card as I pull it up. Okay, so this is a black skate gliding across the sandy bottom. They are often found partially or completely buried in the sand or silt. It makes it a perfect way to camouflage itself. And here's a basket star. It only usually has about five arms, but you can see how they branch off in order to help it with its feeding. And this is a halibut. Going across the bottom there, are lots of cool stuff along the way. Here it is again. It's going by some corals and some crinoids. Those are those feathery sea stars you see around there. And this is one of those bubblegum corals that we talked about earlier. And behind it is a red tree coral. 
and a whole bunch of those feathery sea stars. And this is a wolf eel. <laughs> it's not a wolf, it's not an eel, it's a fish. So you can kind of see why it's called that. <laughs> This is a beautiful sponge that we're going to move out to see. Lots of shrimp living on it. And one of those crinoids, so that's a feathery sea star, and a rockfish even. You see how it creates quite a habitat. And that's just the things that we can see. Another rockfish. <laughs> beautiful. And this here is a Pacific flat nose. With loads of brittle stars in the background. Whoa, how many are there? And here's an octopus. Looks like it's quite small because you can see all the smaller clams and the whelk next to it. Oh, and then a rockfish scared it right off. <laughs> oh, and it looks like it just found something to eat. Delicious. Nice little snack for the day. Very cool. Excellent. That was fun. <laughs> so I could go on for an awful long time showing you these incredible animals. But all of these animals live off of Washington coast in a well-balanced ecosystem. These marine animals depend on a healthy ocean to sustain their life, providing food, shelter, and a safe place to reproduce. And it's everyone's responsibility to take care of the ocean for all of the living things that depend on it. And that includes us. So can you think of some ways that you can help protect the ocean? Go ahead and write in the, some of your ideas on how you can protect the ocean into the question box. And maybe Nicole can go ahead and tell us a few that are you guys write. Okay. Um, yeah, so spread the work, spread the knowledge, um, not polluting, recycle, don't litter, um, use less plastic, use less plastic materials, use coral safe sunscreen, um, stop polluting, use reusable bags, eat sustainably sourced fish. This is an awesome audience, Jacqueline. I think they have been inspired by this. Recycle. Those are all fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody, for those great responses and Nicole for sharing them. Those are great. Well, but now that you've had this chance to explore the Olympic Coast with me and that you have proven yourself to be such great stewards of this ocean planet through all those great answers, um, I want to ask you, what National Marine Sanctuary do you want to visit next? Nicole's going to launch a poll, but first I want you to take a good look at the map. Um, these the poll is going to have just a few examples, including Channel Islands and where you could swim the playful sea lion or Hawaiian Islands, where you could explore the tropical waters with sea turtles and maybe even encounter some sharks. Um, there's Thunder Bay to explore a historic shipwreck or Florida Keys to visit some of the most iconic coral reefs. But if your choice isn't on her poll, go ahead and list your choice in the question box. Go ahead, Nicole. Okay, so our final poll today, which National Marine Sanctuary do you want to visit next? Channel Islands to swim with playful sea lions, Hawaiian Island humpback whale to explore with a sea turtle, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary to dive on one of the historic shipwrecks, or Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary to visit one of the most iconic coral reefs. And the answers are coming in. I'm going to give you guys about mm, five more seconds here. Try and get those answers in. Okay, and I'm going to close the poll. And, ooh, it's split. 30% for Channel Islands, 26% for Hawaiian Island Humpback Whale, 26% for Thunder Bay, and 17% for Florida Keys. And then we got, we got, just so you know, real quick, we got some answers in the box too. Some people want to visit Monitor and someone wanted to visit Papahanao Mokuakea. 
Fantastic, me too, all of the above. <laughs> so I'm gonna introduce you to a cool way to explore our national marine sanctuaries through 360 degree virtual dives. These incredible new virtual experiences allow you to take a sneak peek, a really cool peek into the beautiful depths of national marine sanctuaries without even getting wet. So whether you dive into Olympic coasts to check out fish eating anemones, or choose to dive the historic shipwrecks or the kelp forest with sea lions or coral reef to check out sharks, turtles, tropical fish, and more. Um, the adventures is yours to enjoy. So just go to sanctuaries.noaa.gov slash VR. That stands for virtual reality. Easy to navigate from our homepage. So check it out and enjoy it. So we already learned that um, there was a few bingo win winners. Um, did anybody get all of the answers? Yes, we did have um, several blackouts, I think. I'm trying to remember now. I have to go back to find out who our first blackout was. I think Oliver might have been our first one. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, we've had um, lots of bingo winners and blackouts, triple bingos, five bingos. So. There's been that's, a lot of activity. That's awesome. Well, you guys are all amazing. Congratulations. You're all winners. And I want to thank you for taking this journey with me. And I hope you, like me, keep on searching to learn more about our magnificent ocean and get involved in activities to care for these amazing blue planet of ours. So at this point, I, if we have time, I think we have time for questions. Yeah. So I have one question right away. This was asked early on, but Cindy was wondering, what qualifications do you need for your job, Jacqueline? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Cindy, for asking that. So for me, um, you have to be able to um, reach a lot of different audiences. So being able to communicate well um, and to translate scientific information um, to others. So often we have these great science-minded people who have this great information and we have to translate some of their knowledge to the public. Um, so that's a really important part of that background. Um, I think you have to be able to speak in front of the public or to a computer for that reason, <laughs> for that matter, um, and, and be able to work in a team. Um, in education, everything I do is part of a team, working with others, working um, as, as teams in order to inform the public. And often the public informs me too. Nicole, we had a question from Bridget. Bridget had asked, why do birds eat differently from other animals? Why do birds eat differently? Yes. Well, I think like all animals, animals will eat according to the way that they, they the tools that they have. So a bird who lives maybe on the shore will use its long beak in order to be able to get into the sandy areas to get the animals that live on shore. Whereas other animals that have that maybe soar across the ocean um, in order to collect food along the surface that don't necessarily want to land, they have the large wings in order to skim it. So I think it's really about using the adaptations that they have in order to feed in the areas that they are designed to feed. Great. We also had a question from Victoria who asked, do all whales migrate? That's a great question. Um, I believe most whales migrate. We do have southern resident killer whales um, that will stay in similar areas, but they still do travel quite distances in order to feed and in order to have their young. So um, my understanding is that they most of them do. And Lisa, do you have a better answer? Um, I think that a lot of whales, they go to areas where the water is warm. Here, I'll turn on my camera so you guys can see me. Um, whoops. Sorry, I'm losing my, there. So um, yeah, so I think that a lot of whales migrate to warmer waters to have their young. So a lot of humpback whales go to Hawaii or um, gray whales go down to Mexico and then they come to colder waters to feed when the, the food is plentiful. So that's one of the reasons why whales migrate. And I think most, most whales move from one place to another. Um, they may not have as, as far a migration as other whales, because some whales, um, even in the same species, don't travel as far as other populations of whales. But most most whales do migrate, I think. Yeah. 
Okay, and then Jack, we had one more question from Anya. Sorry, Nicole. Nope, you go first. Okay, so Anya had asked, how old can corals get? Corals can be hundreds of years. There's a lot of beautiful, slow-growing corals that can live to be hundreds of years old. That's why it's really important that we protect them. Um, corals, any animal that lives a really long time, um, they, their populations can be really um, destroyed if we, if we hurt them. So we want to make sure that we protect um, all animals, but especially those slow-growing animals, long-living animals. Um, so Gray is wondering if you could show the VR link again, and I wondered if you could just go back on your slide so they have a chance to make sure they get that written down. There you and go. Then, it should pop up right now. Perfect. Hope you can find that, Gray. And then um, Isabella wondered, what is the weirdest thing you have seen in your job? The we okay, I'll tell you. So I told you I was from the Florida Keys for a while, and um, there was a, it's sawfish, which is an incredible um, fish. It's a combination of a ray, a shark, and a fish, and it's got what looks like a saw on its nose, and it will thrash through the water in order to feed. And I saw this sawfish while I was snorkeling, and it was following, a, a, I'm sorry, behind it was a team of barracuda. So there's like 30 barracuda right behind the sawfish. And, and that is about equal with that, um, the cockatoo squid that I showed you earlier in the deep sea. Those are my two favorite unusual animals in the sea that I've seen. And then Victoria is wondering, Jacqueline, what's your favorite marine anim animal? So I, um, I love harbor seals. They just make my heart explode with, with warmth and happiness. Just They're so curious. And I think that they're as curious about what's above the water as I'm as curious as what's below the water. So I think we have that connection. <laughs> okay, well, we are almost at the end of our time. We can take maybe one or two more questions if we have. Okay, so I see Harper says, um, where can we see harbor seals? So harbor seals are a, a pretty abundant here in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. You can generally see them from the shore. Um, right from my office, we have um, an Olympic Coast Discovery Center. It's currently closed, but we hope that it will open someday soon as we um, have a safer environment. But they'll come right up to our office and they'll pop their head up and look around. And um, they're just really, really lovely um, and, and curious. We also have a question from Kiefer who says, what sea creatures can you only see at Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary? Yeah, um, so there was a, a sponge, we called it the green ball sponge, which was discovered here at Olympic Coast um, while we were doing a deep sea exploration. Um, and I don't think that they've seen that elsewhere, but I could be wrong. Um, but that was pretty incredible to be able to, to see something for the first time that had never been recorded. And I think we have time for one or two other questions. Um, let's see. So Victoria was asking, why do you think marine animals need water? So marine animals, they need water. Um, I think just like all animals need all the, di all the different um, things from the sea and the air and to, to survive. Um, but that's a great question to research. Do you know an answer, Nicole or Lisa? Um, you know, I think that we're now evolved just to, to live in the water. It's kind of like we, we are developed to live on land. And so I think they need the, marine, the water in order to live their lives. I do see another, another, um, question from, from Natalie. Um, she asked, what do you think about the purple urchin bloom along the coast, including Tatoosh Island? Yeah, um, so the purple urchin bloom, um, I know that our sea otters are out there and they've been pretty abundant and eating them, but I do not know right now currently about a current bloom is that might be hurting it, um, I'm guessing with the hurting the kelp, but hopefully our sea otters will help keep them in check. Great. 
Well, I think that we are just about at our hour. So I just wanted to say thank you to Jacqueline and, and Nicole for giving this fantastic presentation and encourage all of our viewers to go and check out the virtual dive site and also the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary website. And once we're able to travel around a little bit more, if, if you guys want to go visit the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, I'm sure Jacqueline and Nicole will welcome you there. Um, I also wanted to remind our viewers that we have another webinar coming up on Wednesday where we'll have Kathy Letts from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center from NOAA Fisheries talking about pollution in the water and how that impacts fish. So thank you so much for your time and your attention and um, we hope to see you back on Wednesday. Thanks Jacqueline and Nicole. Thank you everybody. Bye.